Welcome back to the Gem Cutters Craft. Today we're going to be reviewing the Fralap. So if you've been following along on my channel for a while, you probably have seen me talk about this machine, the Fralap. So this is the French style jam peg machine. I've had this machine for over two months now. I've been cutting pretty regularly, almost every single day that I've been home. I've been playing with this machine. So this review is going to be extremely in-depth. So if you haven't seen the machine before, let's just look at some of the features. So the base machine, the Fralap 6, as it's called on the website, uh, includes a lot of different stuff. So we've got the base of the machine with uh, a six inch lap spindle. So this machine doesn't use eight inch laps. It's a six inch only machine. It's got a removable water pan so you can fill it up, dump it, and replace it. Notice there's no wastewater holes here, so it's not meant to go into a wastewater tank. Essentially, uh, when you fill up the container that comes with, the amount of water that fits in here is the same amount of water that fits into the base, so it can't overflow itself. I found it to be very, very nice in terms of traveling. Uh, or, or even at home. It's really not a big deal to dump this and not have to worry about a hose, uh, a wastewater container. It kind of makes the setup a lot more simple. It makes cleanup really easy. Uh, the fact that this comes off so easy is, is, is actually pretty nice. So I haven't found any uh, detriment to this system. Okay, now the more important section, which is the actual jam peg angles, indexes, all that stuff. So in order to cut on a jam peg, you need a couple different things. You need the head, which in French is called the evention, but I'll just refer to it as the jam peg head for this review. You need the mechanical case, and you also need the stick. So the stick goes into the case, it locks, and now you can place your stick into the jam peg hole and place the case against this reference plate and now you've got angles and indexes. So that's how all modern jam pegs work. If they've got this plate, then they need all that other stuff. If we're gonna facet a stone, there's a few different controls that any modern type of faceting machine needs. You need angles, you need indexes, you need depth. This machine has all of them, though they work a little bit differently than, let's say, a mass machine or a handpiece machine. For our indexes, we've got our stick in the mechanical case and now we can push this down, rotate the stick around, and we can see that there are notches along the edge on both sides. So we've got a plus minus eight on one side, and on the other side we've got a plus minus eight with halfway lines. So we can do 16 different positions inside of the plus minus eight. So they're both moving the same amount. The plus eight is equivalent to the next face over. So we've got eight sides, we've got plus minus eight, so we've got 64 different positions that we can be in, and actually a lot more because of those halfways. Now coming over to the jam peg head, we've got 40 different holes. So we can go anywhere from a very, very low angle here to a very, very high angle here. And then as we move up and down the jam peg head, uh, we occasionally need to move this up and down. So for a very, very low angle, we might need it to be lower, but for the very, very high angle up here, this thing needs to come up so that it's at the right height to meet it. So that is a little bit different than other types of jam pegs, but it's pretty typical for the French type of machine. So that's our angles and our indexes. So as is normal on the jam peg machine, these angle holes don't relate to any specific angle because this thing moves up and down freely and the size of your stone is going to change where your dop hits the lap. This is a relative system and that's how all jam pegs work. There's no specific angle holes even though these are numbered, they're just reference numbers so that you can remember where you're at. Now if we need to fine adjust our angle, we've got the ability to do so here. Turning this makes it go very slowly up or very slowly down. So if we're making a brilliant design and we need to adjust the brakes or adjust the stars, we can do that with this knob. We can also do cheating. Since we've got this reference plate, if we've got our mechanical case against the reference and we can turn this 
a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, that will effectively cheat our facet. So if we wanna tilt left or tilt right or move left or move right, we can do that. So that's our movement. Also, we can just do a general jump up and down if we need to. And so we've got a locking knob here and we've got a locking knob here. Finally, for features, we've got this piece down here. So this is for doing our girdles. Say we wanna do an, uh, an emerald cut. We can easily make our rectangle by doing four sides and then this thing can go up and down. So you can do your four sides of your rectangle and then come up a little bit and then do the four corners at whatever height you need. So this thing is a nice addition to be able to just get you a girdle and give you a reference point to keep everything flat. Now, for anyone who's coming from a mast or handpiece style machine, there's a lot of stuff to learn to be able to use this. This is not uh, as mechanized, as mechanical, as assisted as any other type of machine. There's a lot of skill that needs to be attained to be able to use this machine. Even something as simple as making the girdle, let's say you're gonna make a square, there's nothing telling you whether this is at a 90 degree angle. So if you're not being careful and paying attention, you can make a bad mistake. Same thing goes for here. You know, there's nothing telling you what angle you're at. There's nothing keeping everything straight other than your own hand. You know, there's nothing that's uh, lining up the stone with the index other than your own eye. So there's a lot of stuff that comes into play here and you have to improve your skill set in order to be able to do it. So on to more features. So we, we said already, we've got our water drip tank. It sits up here and it drips uh, with this mechanism. So you twist it one way to open, the other way to close, and it sits right up here. Now I'm gonna put this down here so we can see better. And then we've got our control box over here. So the control box has on and off, forwards and backwards, and a speed controller. Now, one of the features that I really like about this machine uh, is the, the power unit inside. So it's a universal power supply. It works in 110 up to 240. So whether you're in the US, Europe, Australia, Asia, wherever you're at, this machine's gonna work without any kind of step-down converter or step-up converter. It does have a European plug, so if you need to take it to America, you just need to get a plug adapter, but it's not a voltage converter. So for me, this is great. I love the idea that I can just take this anywhere I wanna go. And so we've got this white cable that comes out of the controller box. It plugs into the machine over here, and that provides power to the base. This thing is just held on with a knob, so this thing can move forward and backwards depending on what you need to do. For me, I'm using a two ring polishing lap, so sometimes I do need to move this into the perfect spot so I can hit both rings. And along with the base and, and everything else, so you're gonna get the whole base, the jam peg head, the control box, uh, one mechanical case, which has eight sides. So this is a most used, most common uh, type of mechanical case for the French system. Uh, there's also other types of cases, squares, six-sided. If you needed another one, you could probably order one custom, but as it is, he's just got these eight-sided that come with. Along with the case, you're gonna get three aluminum dop sticks. The ones that came with mine, two of them are essentially keyed and one of them is the traditional one that's just no, no pin, no key. So you notice I've got wax on all three of these. I've been using all, all of them, and uh, this is a wax-only system, so there's no glue involved in this setup. The pin, or the key, uh, fits into here, and there's a little notch right here, so this can be handy. I, I actually don't really like the key, I don't really use it, but there is this key system, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. We have this, in French it's called the tabler. I've just been calling it the dopping block. When you're dopping your stone, you place your stick in here. You've got your stone on the dop, on the wax. And when the wax is still warm and you've got a preform on here, you've got a flat table and you can push the table into this adapter and it will flatten out the table of the stone so that it's at a perfect 90 degree angle with the stick. So this is how we do our initial doffing. The other thing that you can do with this thing, notice there's two lines here, 
So when we're transferring the stone, we finish the crown, we're gonna flip it upside down. How do we do a wax transfer? This is really, really difficult. And one of the things that I learned in the process of using this machine is how to do this wax transfer by eye. And by eye means using these two lines and lining up the opposite side, so the crown side, you're gonna be able to see your crown and align the girdle of the crown up with one of these lines. Now, it sounds very difficult. It actually turned out to be really, really easy. You turn it here, align it, rotate your dop, align it, and just make sure it's aligned all the way around. So if I wanna do it with a stone in there, I just look at it all the way around and I can see, is it straight or not? Now, it doesn't really make sense with this rose cut because there isn't another side, but you know, effectively, you're, you're gonna line up your girdle line and make sure it looks straight. And then when you cut in your new side, your new side will be straight and aligned with the girdle. Easier than it sounds, actually. The other thing that comes with is this little spinner. This is a, let's call it a girdle spinner. I don't know if it has a special name. It's magnetic on the bottom and this thing's magnetic, so it hooks right onto here. And what this allows you to do, you can spin around easily. Uh, well, easily enough. It's not so easy, it's a little tricky, and just like everything else with this machine, it involves a lot of hand-eye coordination and a lot of checking your work. But simple enough that you could just put this on here and spin it like this, and your lap is spinning, and, and you can make your, your round that way. So that's handy. The other thing that comes with, and I'm not totally sure why, is this transfer block. Now in the French technique, I've never known anyone to ever use a transfer block, so I'm not sure if this is um, designed to open up the technique to uh, an American audience, or maybe there are some French cutters that I have never met that are using this, but this basically works the same way that a American style transfer block does. You put one in here and you tighten it, and you can put another one in here and tighten it and do your transferring. I've never used this. I didn't use this in, in, in the entire time that I've used this machine. This is probably the last I'll mention of this, but it does come with. So if you like extra goodies with your machine, a little bit of added value for your money. So we've got a base, jam peg head, control box, one mechanical case, three batons, the girdle spinner, the tabler, the table adapter, the water drip. That's your base package. Now, if you want to cut a stone with only these, it's possible, it's, it works well, it's easy to use. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed using this machine. It's been a blast and I'm gonna to continue to use it. Though I wanna talk about some of the extra goodies that he's come out with or is coming out with um, because I think that it really enhances the faceting experience. So if you want to cut a stone with just the base setup, you've got your stone in the case, it's locked, you can go around and cut with your mechanical stick, and that's fine. When you want to do your table now, there's no way to cut at zero degrees or straight down. So the way that the French do it, they heat up the wax, they tilt it to a 45 degree angle or something that looks like a 45 degree angle. They find it over here. So another one of these steps that takes a lot of hand-eye coordination and thinking. And they cut the table, they polish the table, they tilt the stone back to zero, zero, and then they readjust everything. So there's a lot of playing around to get it all straight. Now, one of the things that he's come out with since I got the machine is this table cutter. Now this thing hooks on over here, so my machine, um, I just added a screw here. Uh, there's already a hole for that. So you just put, place it on here, you lock it in. And once this is on here, there's really no reason to ever take it off. I often just leave mine sitting right there on the side, and then when I wanna use it, I set it over here. Now the way this works, uh, two different ways. The traditional way of using a table cutter, you put the stick into the cutter, you come down. Now notice there's some knobs here, so you have adjustments. You can tilt left and right, that's your cheater. 
you can tilt back and forward, that's your other cheater. So sometimes when you're cutting or polishing the table, you'll see that it's not polishing in straight. Maybe it needs to be tilted back or forth a little bit or left or right a little bit. This thing allows you to do that. It's so handy and so easy, but the cool thing is, and this is a modern adaptation, uh, notice this little block right here. So if you wanna cut or polish the table while it's in the case, all you need to do Put it in here and your mechanical case aligns with this block. So when you want to go back and polish your table, you can make sure that you're lined up to the exact same side that you were before. That is so, so handy. So having this on here means we never have to adjust and heat up the stone and tilt it to 45 degrees. That's a whole mess that we just get to skip. And having this little extra block on here that gives us the ability to have a reference means we never have to get lost. I can always remember that I'm cutting my table on the side of the numbers that I'm using. That's what I always do. So then I never forget, okay, I wanna go cut it again, pull this up, boom, polish, cut, whatever I wanna do. If I need to make the table bigger because maybe my stars got a little overlapped or whatever, it's very easy to just come back and use the same alignment that I cut with the first time and do it. And then if I need to make little adjustments, I can. There's a... Um, a locking screw on the back here so I can tighten it up. I can also lock this up here so it stays, or I can sit it and this thing moves up and down and locks. So I can pretty much put it wherever I want. I usually just keep it down here so it doesn't get dirty. And then whenever I wanna bring it up, I can set it up on here. I love this. If you're gonna buy this machine, I definitely recommend that you get one of these. It saves time, it saves hassle, it makes the stone cut a lot faster, a lot easier, not having to adjust and all that stuff. Just get that. That's my recommendation. I just looked at the website. This thing is not actually up on the website yet, meaning it's not for sale yet. So I don't know how much the price is. I don't know when it's gonna be available. I'm guessing this is sort of the prototype version, but I've been using it for more than a month now. I love it. And I, to me, this is an essential part of the kit. I will not use this machine or travel without having the table cutter. Really, really good. So that's a, additional expense, an additional piece of kit that I think is highly recommended for this machine. Now there's one more piece of kit that's come out since I got the initial machine two plus months ago, and that is the cam preformer. So the cam preformer lets you do shaped girdles. So the cam is this white part right here that goes on, and whenever you get it, it comes with a bunch of different cams. You've got uh, square cushion shape, oval shape, triangle shape, square shape, um, pear shape, and oval. Oh yeah, this, this is more like a marquee. So marquee and an oval. And then you've got the round, which I have mounted on here. So the way that this thing works, you take off this, you place this down. This is gonna sit on here. And then if you want, you can, and this is what I, the way I've been keeping it, you can just put this right back on and then this thing can just sit under there forever. When you're not using it, it sits over here. And then when you wanna use it, it comes over here. Now, it has to be positioned in the right way, so something right around there. This thing can tighten and lock. And then now what you can do, and this is where the, uh, the key pins come in. So these little pins on here, line up with only one spot here. So theoretically, so if you loosen that up, the pin goes right in there, pull this back so it's locked in here. And now theoretically, you can preform your stone and make your oval or your marquee or whatever, and then when you go to put it into here, it's gonna line up with the outline of the eight sides. So if you make a perfect square in here, and you come and you bring it and you line up the pin, it will perfectly align with the eight sides, the index. So that's kind of cool. Uh, on paper, I've used this a few times with mixed results. I've never used a cam preformer on any other machine, but I've seen what they look like and they pretty much all work the same. You spin the stone around on the cam and it pushes it up and down. So if I had a pear shape on here, it would push it up and down along the cam shape. Now the round shape, it'll just sit here and spin. 
Now in my experience so far using this, it's a little harder than it sounds because you need to be spinning, the lap needs to be spinning, and you need to be putting pressure on this. And if it's going up and down and the shape, so the best way to do it is you start with a rough preform. So make your round shape by hand or make your pear shape or your oval shape by hand, then dap it, then put it in here, then start doing this. I haven't had great experience with this and I don't think it has anything to do with this setup. What I think is my centered laps, even my 100 grit centered lap is not rough enough to really do this uh, effectively. I think you need to have like a 100 grit topper, something really, really coarse that's really gonna take off a lot of material at a time and that's gonna help you. I've just been having a hard time getting the preform to come out exactly the way it is without spending like 20 minutes and trying to manually manipulate it and fix it. But I don't think there's anything wrong with the cams or the, or the preforming thing in general. Um, I think you just need to find the right lap setup that's going to be actually a good biting preforming lap, which is not something that I normally use because if you're hand preforming and hand shaping, you can really push down. This one, you can only push down so much and then, you know, you, you've got to be spinning and everything. So um, this is handy. And, and what I was most excited about with the cam preformer is not really having all these different cams because while this is fun, as a professional cutter, it's not often that you're gonna have a piece of rough that perfectly matches up with this marquee shape or this cushion shape, or you know, there, there's a million varieties of cushions and pairs and ovals, and usually you need to hand shape them around the, the rough. So the cam isn't really gonna be super handy in my workflow, but what I was mostly excited about was the round, which is why this is on here. Now, if I'm on a handpiece or a mast, it's super easy to spin the, the quill and make a perfect round in, you know, five minutes or so. Um, with this system, there's not a good way. Without having this cam preformer on here, how do we make a round? You know, we've got our stone dopped on here. Um, the French way to do it is to make an eight-sided and then use the index and split it and then halfway cut eight more facets and eight more facets and eight more facets until eventually you have all those facets making the round. I don't really like doing that, it takes forever. Um, you could use this thing. This thing works okay, but it's a little bit hard to use. I mean, not really that hard to use, but you know, you put one finger down here, you spin it around. Um, I probably should spend some more time practicing and playing with it to see what's the better way to make a round. Because maybe in, in a normal workflow, if you're not needing cams, Maybe this is just extra kit that's unnecessary. It's fun, and I think as a hobbyist, it's nice to be able to play with all these different shapes and try different stuff. Um, but for me, mostly I'm just interested in having a fast way of doing rounds. If I'm traveling, I definitely probably wouldn't take this with me. It's just extra weight and stuff that I don't need, especially when this thing's on here and is easy enough and is very light and small and comes with the machine. So the Cam Preformer, if you want it, go for it. If you don't think you're gonna need all those shapes, I think it's probably extra, extra fun that you may or may not need. Let's now talk about uh, experience, workflow. How well does the machine work? So let's talk about the pros first. So if I put my lap on here, uh, I've had no problem adjusting and learning this machine. Now, I wouldn't recommend this machine to somebody who has never faceted before. If you don't have a teacher or someone that can show you how to use the machine, it's, it's very difficult to get going because you just don't know how to use it. There's no books, there's not a lot of videos, there's not a lot of online content, websites, anything uh, that talk about how to use this machine. So this is definitely an advanced type of machine or a machine that you really need a mentor for. Some things that I've added on in order to make my experience more pleasant and easier. Uh, first thing is this digital inclinometer, this angle reader. If I stick this on the lap, I turn it on, I zero it. Now it's reading zero degrees. I have my stick in the mechanical case. Now the cool thing is this thing has magnets on the bottom. The, the case is magnetic too. So as I pick which hole I'm in, this thing will actually tell me exactly what angle I'm at all the way up. Um, I'm not gonna use this for every single facet or every single angle, but if I wanna figure out my crown mains or more importantly, if I wanna figure out my critical angle for the stone, I, I pretty much always do use this to double check, okay, where's my crown angle that I like? Where's the critical angle? 
and then I can build from there. If I don't know the critical angle, and I didn't have this for the first few stones that I did, if you look on my Instagram, you'll see that those stones had windows because I just had no idea, you know, where's 40, where's 38, where's 35? Um, I don't really care to know the angle of every single facet, but there's a couple that I do, and it's the crown mains and the critical angle. From there, I can build every design I wanna know, but I need to know those two things just so I know where I'm at. Uh, other things that I've added, um, simply enough, these two little plastic things. So you'll notice I put in my centered lap. My centered lap is just barely under this splash guard. So if I don't put anything on here, it splashes all over the place. The splash guard is not tall enough for the center lap because the center lap is so tall. Now that's not really a unique problem to this machine. Facetrons have the exact same problem. You put in a tall lap, they splash all over the place. So I've just cut these two pieces of plastic off of some material that I had in my workbench. And I, I pretty much just leave these in here all the time. Um, that prevents the splash just a little bit higher. And it also gives me the extra benefit of having a little guard on the door. So if I'm not doing a girdle, I keep that splash area closed. The other thing is I've changed out this water container. I don't really like this. I think this is definitely the weakest point of the machine. Um, it's just a plastic jug. Uh, I don't really like this thing. It's very hard to turn. Uh, and when you do turn it, you can see it pushes in the, the, the jug quite a lot. It's not easy to use and it's not easy to get a very fine drip. Um, also, I just find it to be unattractive. So for me, I completely got rid of this and uh, I, I actually just took this whole thing off and I got a nice, beautiful antique glass dripper that I've been using. Um, but mostly that's just aesthetics. This thing works just fine. It's just not as pleasant as I'd like it to be. The other thing is it does actually get rusty. And I think maybe if we look in here, yeah, you'll see. There's a little bit of, of rust. So I think if I was gonna use this thing long-term, this plastic jug, I would change this out for um, something better. And I know that there's some really nice adjustable dripper things that you can get from the hardware store that are used for refrigerator ice makers that have a very nice control. I've used those on some of my American style machines. I love them. So if I was gonna use this long-term and not switch this whole thing out, I would just switch the actual mechanism in here to one of those. Um, that being said, if that's the weakest link of the whole machine, that's pretty easy to fix and it's really not that big of a deal. It's very minor. The other big negative for me, I think, is the fact that the entire machine is raw aluminum. I think you can probably see over here where my dripper's been sitting. It's oxidized the metal really, really bad. Also, if I take off the uh, splash guard, you can see the area where it sits. Also, there's this ring on here. There's some other crud on here. Now, I spent a good 10 minutes before starting this video cleaning up the machine. I use uh, white vinegar and water. I use lemon and salt. I cannot get these marks off anymore. And I think that just kind of sucks because it makes the machine look a lot dirtier and older than it is. I think it would be a good idea if this was anodized. You know, the whole thing is black or gray or whatever color. Um, I'm actually thinking about getting mine anodized, taking the whole machine apart and going to a local anodizing place and just having them anodize at least the, the top plate because this part, it's getting all the abuse, it's getting all the water and um, it would be great if it was just more protected, not getting oxidized. I'm not sure if it really matters so much with the, with the side plate, but maybe I'll do the whole thing if I'm gonna do it. Um, it's not a deal breaker for me, but I think you're looking at something that's a little bit more DIY versus something really, really professional and well-made. And I think at the price point where this is at, it needs to be done to justify the price of the machine. I think the features are all there. Uh, it, it works really, really well. I've had no problem uh, finding my angles, finding my indexes, and getting the depth, you know, all the things I need to do. But there's just a couple little things. For the price, for the package, for what you get, I think it's awesome. For me in particular, for my personal needs, this machine was the best jam peg 
that I could find for what I wanted to do with it, which was to have a small footprint that I could travel with. The whole machine with the power base and all of the other stuff you need to do fastening can fit into a suitcase that is under 30 kilos, which means I can fly and have traveled around with this now. It's awesome. There's definitely not another jam peg machine. I don't know if there's another faceting machine that you could fit the entire thing with your laps and all your accessories into a suitcase and take it on an airplane and not go over the weight limit. So that's why I wanted this. I wanted to learn JAMPEG. I wanted something that was small and portable and easy to use. The fact that it's made for six inch laps might be annoying for you if you're using eight inch laps, you already have a whole collection. For me, I love it because I was already using six inch laps. The centered laps are a lot cheaper when they're six inches and, and I just like them better that way. They're also lighter for traveling. Other things that I've done in order to make my life easy. So if you have this, the table cutter, you've got this jam peg head and you've got this plate, that's three different things that need to be adjusted so that they're all flat. So let's say you're cutting an emerald cut. You do your eight sides based on this plate. Now this plate is the only thing that doesn't have any adjustment. It goes up and down. It can't move left, right, forward, or back. So to me, what I've realized is this has to be my ultimate reference point. If I cut a rectangle on this thing and it's flat, then when I put it to the jam peg head, the jam peg head needs to be adjusted to match the girdle of that. So I've figured out where that is left to right and I put a little mark on top of here. Notice this little line. There's nothing on here to let you know where's the middle. So you have to do that yourself and this is how I've figured out to do it. This might not be the best way to do it but this is what I've done in my own experience. Cut your square, your rectangle or your emerald cut, the girdle first, then Cut in your first facet so that the facet is perfectly aligned with the girdle and then you know your left and right balance so you can say this is perfectly set to this. Then go ahead and cut your table with this, get it all lined up and then you can figure out where's the left and right balance, where's the front and back balance. Maybe you want to mark it, maybe it doesn't matter. Usually when I, when I want to zero this out left front to back I just make sure that this piece is aligned with this piece so I'll back it up a little bit right around there visually looks straight and then left to right same thing I can make sure that these two pieces are flush and just touch it and see that's how I zero this one out and then if I need to make some adjustments I'll make them from there so far it's been really really good I haven't had any big complaints about it most of the complaints have been for myself just just getting the hang of it I do feel like sometimes this thing can be a little wobbly and you have to regularly tighten these screws. Now I've only been hand tightening them because if you tighten them too tight then your cheater doesn't work anymore. But if they're too loose, for instance here, you, you get some, if they're too loose then you get some wobble and that will definitely affect your fastening. So these things have to be tight and you kind of have to check them regularly. That's a little bit of an annoying thing but okay it's just part of this machine. Um, same thing here, well there's not really anything getting loose um, you just need to make sure that everything is tight and actually yes there is another screw down here that can get loose so these things also have to be hand tightened as well just to make sure that you're not getting wobble and play occasionally I don't realize that they're loose and I start seeing that my facets start splitting or doubling or whatever and then I'm like oh are these tight something's loose there's some play here but then as soon as you tighten them up the play goes away and uh, you're fine. So if you just make sure that at the beginning of each stone uh, that you make sure that these are tightened by hand, you should be fine. So all in all, for what this machine is, I think it's awesome. I love it. I'm having a great time with it. I've cut some really beautiful stones. I think this is probably stone 14, and I'm just now, after 14 stones, really feeling confident that I'm almost ready to do customer work with this. Not quite, because I'm still making a few mistakes and when the designs get really, really complicated, I'm still getting a little bit lost um, around the index gear. That's my own personal journey, not part of this review, but I think within two or three months of, of using this, if you already know how to cut, you should be able to get pretty proficient to be able to cut whatever stone you're dreaming of cutting. That being said, this is a, a, a type of machine style that's designed for commercial use. So the idea of doing a 500 facet stone uh, with all kinds of intricate meat points and brilliant stars and everything, it's not really what this is made for. If you wanna do that, 
the American machine or the Sri Lankan machine is a better idea. If you're going to be doing customer work, which is round brilliance, oval mix cuts, emerald cuts, square step cuts, the traditional 50 cuts that are in my book, this is really what this is for. If you're gonna push into the world of competition or just really complicated, crazy cuts with very specific angles, it's possible. It's gonna take longer to, to, for you to get good at doing it that way. Um, I think in the end, you can do it. Of course, if we look at the master cutters of France, they can do anything and everything, you know, from very complicated briolettes, to very big stones with lots and lots of facets. I mean, if you go into some of the museums in France and look at some of the old stones, especially some of the lapidary museums that have kind of the showcase stones of gem cutters, some of those stones are very, very complicated and they're doing it on something as simple as this. So I think just to close out, I would say I would recommend this machine. It's not perfect. You know, you have to make sure that everything's working well and there's a lot of your own intuition as a cutter that has to come into it, but like any jam peg machine, it, it's going to be like that. I definitely would recommend adding the table cutter to it. I kind of wish that was part of the uh, base model because I feel like for a modern cutter, you want this piece to not have it in there. I mean, I know that traditionally the French machines didn't have that, but we're in 2024 and I think anybody who's gonna use this machine is gonna want this. And to make it be extra, um, I think, I would wish that it was just in the base model. I think the cam preformer definitely is an extra accessory that we don't always need. It's fun, I'm glad I have it, but um, not, not crucial. But I think for me, this one, now that I've used it, I think it is crucial. The feature base has been great. The fact that the machine can travel so easily, the power is so flexible, all going all over the world. And even though this motor is probably a little bit smaller than some of the other motors that you'll see in a hobby or professional faceting machine, I haven't found it to be a problem whether I'm using a centered lap or my big uh, six inch pewter lap, which is quite thick and quite heavy. The motor has been fine. Sometimes I'll crank it all the way up to max speed if I'm doing, um, you know, a big stone cutting and it's worked really, really well. I can definitely feel that this, this motor is not as heavy and strong as, for instance, the one that's in my Sri Lankan machine. But honestly, if, if I turn it all the way up to 10 and I feel a little bit of a drag when I'm pulling on it, I don't really mind. It hasn't affected anything in terms of cutting or polishing. So I think that actually the motor suits this machine quite well. I've used this for extended periods of time, up to six to eight hours with no problems with heat or anything like that. Um, the motor seems to be able to last. That being said, I've only used it for two and a half months or so, so we'll see how it performs over the course of years. But so far, it's met my expectations. So all in all, I think it's a great machine. If you're thinking about a jam peg machine and you want a kind of a French style handmade machine, something a little bit more bespoke than some of the other things that are on offer, I think this is a good package. Um, I'm not sure of the price of the table adapter. I'm not sure of the price of the cam preformer, but this machine base without these two accessories is something around $2,700 to $2,800, depending on where you are in the world. So it compares to some of the lower end American machines, you know, as far as price point goes. Um, it's slightly more than like the Sri Lankan Sterling machine, um, but not, not, worlds away, you know, in that $2,000 to $2,500 range. This is, this is just right above that. If you'd like to see a video of me cutting an entire stone using every part of the machine, the cam preformer, the table cutter, the jam peg, and all of the features of the mechanical stick, there's going to be a, a link at the end of the video that you can watch a whole process of me cutting one entire stone if you want to see the full experience of using this machine. I think if you're thinking about a machine, for JamPeg, this is definitely a good contender. It's got all the features we want. You know, it's got a nice um, mechanical stick. It's got very adaptable, adjustable features and uh, a nice size and footprint if you need to travel around the world like me. I'm having fun with this. And if you're thinking about it, maybe you can have some fun with it too. Um, all the details for this machine are going to be on the Fralap website. I know he's been working to get an English translation of the website up. If it's not up when you're looking at it, then pretty much every browser now has a little translate to English button in the menu bar. So just check it out in the translated form. It's pretty 
usable. Antoine, the guy who runs Fralap, speaks English, so if you need to contact him, you can do it in French or in English. He's usually bouncing between Canada and France, so he'll be somewhere in the world. And uh, I just want to thank him. I bought this machine, but he provided some of the extra stuff, um, the prototype stuff, for free, at least for free so far, which is why I don't know how much they cost. Um, but all of the opinions that I present today are mine. He's not asked me to say anything um, other than I told him I was going to do a review of the video. So he doesn't know what I'm saying, and uh, I don't know what he thinks about what I'm saying. So these are my opinions, and hopefully you find them helpful. And um, hopefully I can continue to look at other JAMPEG machines and other types of machines that are being offered around the world today. I'll be right here on YouTube, or you can find me on Instagram, or find me on Patreon. If you've been enjoying all of the free content that I've been putting out, please consider sponsoring me over there. That really helps to keep the videos free and to keep the channel going. So this has been Justin K. Prim, and I'll see you right here next time on the Gem Cutters Craft. See you then.